The Search for the Missing Fortune by Percy James Brebner Whenever he had solved a case, if not to the world's satisfaction, to his own, Quarles seldom mentioned it again. He professed to think little of his achievement, a pose which I have no doubt concealed a considerable amount of satisfaction and self-complacency. Of the curious case connected with the Bryants, he was, however, rather proud, and since it resulted in making things easier for Zena and me, I have every reason to be satisfied. It began in a strange way. A simple-looking old man, his clothes a size too large for him, walked into a large pawnbroker's one day, and handing him a scarf pin, asked how much he could be given for it. The pin was no use to him. He didn't want to pawn it but to sell it. The customer was requested to put a price upon his property, and after some hesitation he asked whether twenty pounds would be too much. The man in the shop went into a back room ostensibly to consult his superior, in reality to send for the police. It happened that a quantity of jewelry had been stolen from a well-known society lady a few weeks before, and pawnbrokers had had special notice of the fact, hence the firm's precaution. The simple old man had offered for twenty pounds a diamond that was worth at least twenty times that amount. Being interested in the jewel robbery, I was naturally keen to know all that could be discovered about this simple old man and I will give the story as I told it to Christopher Quarles, after I had made the most minute inquiries. The old man's name was Sims, James Sims, and for the last year he had resided with a niece, who was married and living at Fulham. Until twelve months ago he had been manservant to an old gentleman named Ottershaw, living at Norberton, who he said had given him the pin. Mr. Ottershaw was a retired Indian servant, who chose to live a lonely life, and was evidently an erratic individual. Although there was no direct evidence on the point, nothing to show that he had any income beyond his pension, or any property beyond the old house at Norberton, which he had bought, the idea got abroad that he was an exceedingly wealthy man. Sims declared that he had never seen any evidence of great wealth. His master was aware of what was said, and used to chuckle about it, but he never in any way endorsed the story. At the same time, he didn't deny it, and indeed fostered the idea to some extent by saying that he hoped to keep his anxious relatives waiting until he was a hundred. Those relatives consisted of two nephews and a niece, the children of Mr. Ottershaw's sister, who had been some years his senior. Both the nephews, George and Charles Bryant, were married. The niece was a spinster whose sole interest in life was foreign missions. The Bryants had money just sufficient to obviate the necessity to work, and, so far as the two brothers were concerned, they were undoubtedly chiefly concerned in waiting for a dead man's shoes. Miss Bryant hoped to become rich for the sake of her missionary work. All of them were convinced of their uncle's wealth. The old gentleman did not attain his century. He caught a chill, pneumonia set in, and in three days he was dead. Sims declared that about a month before his death his master had given him the pin with the remark, "'You have been a good servant, Sims. This is a little gift in recognition of the fact.' It's worth a few pounds, and should you outlive me and find yourself hard up, you can turn it into money. Sims had not found himself hard up. He had saved enough to live quietly upon. But his great-niece, of whom he was very fond, was going to be married, and he thought he would turn the pin into money as a nest egg for her. Mr. Ottershaw's will was a curiosity. It began with a very straightforward statement that the testor was aware that his relatives had for long past been hoping for his death. No doubt they would have come to live with him had he allowed it, to see that his money did not go to strangers. They have their reward, the will went on. I leave all I am possessed of to George, Charles, and Mary Bryant in equal shares without any restrictions whatever. But, since during my lifetime my nephews and niece have undoubtedly speculated concerning my wealth, I feel it would be a pity if my death were to rob them suddenly of so pleasant an occupation. Frankly, I would take what wealth I have with me if I could. This being impossible, I suppose, I have placed it in a safe place, so that in order to find it, my relatives will still be able to speculate and exercise their ingenuity. For their guidance, I may say that I deposit it in a place, while alone, in one of the rooms of my house at Norberton, that I did not send it out of the house, yet if the house is burnt down, or pulled down brick by brick, it will not be found. The will then went on to provide that the house should not be sold for five years, nor anything taken out of it. During this period, his nephews and niece were to have free access to it whenever they wished, 
or any person they might appoint could visit it. If they chose, they could let it furnish for five years. They could burn it or pull it down if they liked, but if it were intact at the end of five years, it was to be sold and the proceeds equally divided. These are the only conditions, the will concluded. But as I am doing so much for my relatives, I may just mention two things, which I should like done, but they are in no way commands. On the finding of my wealth, if it is found, I should like ten percent of it given to a society or societies for the feeble-minded. And, as I have explained to my relatives more than once, I should like to be cremated. But I leave the decision to them. If cremation is considered too expensive, I must be buried in the usual way. Although the house in Norberton was still intact, I was told by George Bryant that during the last twelve months every nook and cranny had been searched without avail. He still believed that the wealth was hidden somewhere, but he had begun to doubt whether it would ever be found. Naturally, when he heard of Sim's attempt to sell it down in Pinn, his hopes revived. His brother Charles had always thought that Sims knew something, but he himself had not thought so. Now the affair was on an entirely different footing. When I had told my story in the empty room at Chelsea, I think we were all three convinced that this was the toughest problem we had ever tackled. Did the relatives respect the old man's wish and have the body cremated? Zena asked. No, he was buried in the cemetery at Kingston. Then they don't deserve to find the money, and I hope they won't. I do not like the relatives, I returned. But in this matter there is something to be said for them. They have always been opposed to cremation, a fact which Mr. Ottershaw knew quite well, and recognizing the contemptuous tone of the will, not unreasonably. I think they decided that the wish was expressed only to annoy them, and that their uncle had no real desire to be cremated. One of your absurd questions, said Quarles. It seems to me I have never asked a more natural or more sensible one, said Zena. I won't argue, my dear, Quarles returned. I presume that paper you have there, Wigan, is a copy of the wording of the will? Yes, and I handed it to him. Of course, you do not think Sims has any connection with this jewel robbery you have been engaged upon? No, he would not be selling so valuable a stone for twenty pounds. And you have come to the conclusion that his story is a plain statement of facts? I think so. You are not sure? Well, one cannot close one's eyes to the possibility that he may dislike the Bryants as much as his master did, and may be keeping his master's secret, I answered. Or he may have learned his secret by chance, said Zena. He may, said the professor. You question him upon that point, Wigan? He says he knows nothing. What has become of the pin? It is in the hands of the police at present, but will be handed back to him. There is no evidence whatever that he is not the rightful owner. The Bryants wanted to have him arrested. Quarles spread out the paper and began reading parts of the will in a slow, thoughtful manner. Frankly, I would take what wealth I have with me if I could. And Quarles repeated the sentence twice. That might imply there was no wealth to speak of, and following this idea for a moment, the permission to burn down the house or pull it down might suggest the hope in the old man's mind that the frantic search for what did not exist would result in the destruction of even that which did, the house and furniture. The fact that he desires ten percent of the wealth, if it is found to go to him souls, rather favors this notion, and his wish to be cremated may be an attempt to make his relatives spend money upon him, from whom they were destined to receive nothing. It would be a grim joke, I said. A madman's humor, perhaps, said Zena. He goes on, this being impossible, I suppose, and then says he has hidden his wealth. He did not seem quite certain that he could not take it with him, did he? You think? No, no, said Quarles. I haven't got as far as thinking anything definite yet. The will then explains in a riddle where the treasure is hidden. He was alone in a room. He didn't send the treasure out of the house. The statements are so deliberate that I'm inclined to believe in a treasure of some sort. So am I, I answered, because of the valuable pin he gave to his man. When was this will made? asked Quarles. Nine years ago. Living as they did, he would hardly spend his pension, the professor went on. Money would accumulate in nine years, and since there is no evidence he did anything else with it, may assume that the hoard was periodically added to, and therefore he must have placed it where he could get at it without much difficulty. For a moment Quarles studied the paper. I think we may take his statements literally, he went on. So unless the treasure was very small, small enough to be concealed inside a brick, it seems obvious that it was not hidden in the walls of the house, or it would have been found in the process of pulling down. 
we are to be quite literal, we must remember that he says brick by brick, I pointed out. It might therefore be hidden in the brick. I have thought of that, Quarles returned. But in pulling down, bricks would get broken, especially a hollow brick, as this would be. I think we may take the words to mean only total demolition, and that there is no special significance in the expression brick by brick. Burning does away with the idea that the treasure may be hidden in woodwork. If you put it under a ground floor room or under a cellar, neither pulling down nor a fire would disclose it, said Dina. Every flag in the cellars has been taken up, I answered, and all the ground underneath the house has been dug up. Is there a well? she asked. No, that was the first thing I looked for when I came there. He says in a room, Quarles went on. I don't think that means a cellar. Do you think the treasure was small in bulk and placed in this coffin? said Zena eagerly, leaning forward in her chair as she asked the question. Certainly, in that case, he would be perfectly justified in saying that he didn't send it out of the house, said Quarles. It is most improbable, I said. To begin with, Mr. Ottershaw wished to be cremated, so would hardly leave any such instructions. And further, Sim saw him placed in his coffin, and says nothing was buried with the body. It is an interesting problem, said the professor, but one does not feel very much inclined to help the Bryants. Then you have a theory? I asked. I haven't got so far as a theory. I am only rather keen to try my wits. There is a shadowy idea at the back of my brain which may be gone by morning. If it hasn't, we'll go and see Sims. Next morning, when I went to Chelsea, as I had arranged to do, I found Quarles waiting for me, and we went to Fulham together. Sims had two rooms in his niece's house, but took his meals with the family. We went into his sitting room, and he was quite ready to talk about Mr. Ottershaw. I told him that Quarles was a gentleman who thought he could find the hidden money. I shall be very glad if he does, said Sims. The Bryants will know, then, that I had nothing to do with it. Mr. Charles has been the worst, but since I tried to sell that pin, Mr. George has been as bad. I take it you don't like the Bryants, said Quarles. I don't dislike them, only when they bother me. Your master didn't like them? Didn't he? I never heard him say. He wasn't in the habit of saying much to anybody, not even to me. You were fond of him? Loved him. He wasn't what you'll call a love boat character. But I loved him, and he liked me. You see, him and me were born in the same neighborhood, five miles out of Worcester. And when he came back from India, he came down there to see an old friend, since dead, and I happened to be there at the time out of a job. That's how we came together fifteen years ago. You didn't go out once to Norberton? Not until three years afterward. Where were you during those three years? In several places, part of the time in Switzerland and in Germany. Now about this treasure, Mr. Sims? Bless you, sir, I don't believe in it. The will very distinctly mentions it. I know I've heard such a lot about that will from the Bryants that I know it almost by heart. It was a joke, that's what I think. Why, Mr. Charles has asked me more than once whether I didn't slip it into his coffin. Mr. Ottershaw gave you no such instructions, I suppose, said Quarles. The only instructions he gave me were that I was to lay him out and to see him put into his coffin if he was buried, and whatever happened to see him decently carried out of the house. There was some talk of his being cremated, and I suppose the master didn't know how they would take him away then. No doubt he thought the Bryants would have a woman to lay him out, so he left a letter for me to show them. The master always did hate women. And you did this for him? Gladly, and I helped the undertaker lift him into the coffin. I was there when he was screwed down. So were Mr. George and Mr. Charles. There was nothing but the body buried. Nothing. The Bryants wouldn't have him cremated, I understand, said Quarles. And quite right, too, said Sims. It's a heathenish custom, that's what I think. And you don't believe there was any large sum of money? No, I don't. I should have seen some sign of it. Your master gave you a very valuable pin, said Quarles. I don't suppose you had seen that before? It's true, I hadn't. There may have been other valuables where that came from. I don't think it, said Sims. I don't believe the master himself knew it was so valuable. As we walked up the Fulham Road, I asked the professor what he thought of Sims. Simple and honest, I fancy. You're not quite sure? Not quite, but then I'm not sure of anything in this affair yet. I suggest we go and see Mr. George Bryant. I want his permission to go over the house at Norberton. George Bryant lived in Wimbledon, and we found him at home. Much of our conversation went over old ground and need not be repeated here. But the professor was evidently not very favorably impressed with Bryant. Nor did Brian appear to think much of Quarles. He smiled contemptuously at some of his questions, and when asked for permission to visit the house at Norberton, he said he must consult his brother and sister. 
"'Except that I am keenly interested in the affair as a puzzle, I don't care one way or the other,' said Quarles. "'Whether you handle the money or not is immaterial to me, but I have a strong impression that I can find it.' "'In that case, of course.' "'There are conditions,' said Quarles, "'and one or two more questions. "'I am willing to answer any questions. "'Did you often visit your uncle?' Only twice in ten years, and on each occasion he was not very well. A touch of gout, which was what made him so ill-tempered, I imagine. My brother Charles was with me on one occasion. My sister, I believe, never went there. Yet you all expected to profit by his death. His letter certainly gave us to understand that we should, and so far the will was no surprise to us. Has the clause in the will which forbids the removal of anything from the house been observed? Quarles asked. Most certainly. I mean, with regard to trifling things. Nothing has been taken. Of course the will has been complied with. It wasn't, with regard to Mr. Ottershaw's cremation? We do what we consider to be right, and I refuse to discuss that question. For my own part, I believe if James Sims could be forced to speak, the mystery would be at an end. I cannot help feeling that the police have failed in their duty by not having him arrested. I dare say that is a question my friend Detective Wigan will refuse to discuss, said the professor. Do you care to hear my conditions? You can talk them over with your brother and sister when you consider whether I shall be allowed to go over the house or not. I shall be glad to know your fee, said Bryant. For a moment I thought Quarles was going to lose his temper. I charge no fee, he said quietly after a momentary pause. But if the money is found through me, you must give ten percent for the benefit of imbeciles according to the wish of the deceased, and you must pay me ten percent. That will leave eighty percent for you to divide. Preposterous! Bryant exclaimed. As you like. Those are my conditions, and I must receive, with the permission to visit the house, a properly witnessed document, showing that the three of you agree to my terms. I'm afraid you will wait in vain. It is your affair, said Quarles, with a shrug of his shoulders. Remember, I can find the money, and I believe I am the only man who can. On our way back to town, I asked Quarles whether he expected to get the permission. Certainly I do. George Bryant is too greedy for money to miss such a chance. And do you really mean that you can find the money? At any rate, I mean the Bryants to pay heavily for it if I do. Quarles was right. Three days later, the permit and required document arrived, and we went to Norberton. As I had visited the house already, I was prepared to act as a guide to the professor, but he showed only a feeble interest in the house itself. The only room he examined with any minuteness was the bedroom Mr. Ottershaw had used, and he seemed mainly to be proving to his own satisfaction that certain possibilities which had occurred to him were not probabilities. There's a ten percent reward hanging to this, Wigan, he juggled. We're out to make money on this occasion. Bryant seems to have spoken the truth. The place appears to be much as Mr. Ottershaw left it. He had opened a cupboard in the bedroom and took up two or three pairs of boots to look at. Large feet, hadn't he? Went in for comfort rather than elegance. I never saw uglier boots, but they are well made, nothing cheap about them. You don't expect to find the money in his boots, do you? Never heard of hollow heels, Wigan? He asked. You couldn't hide much money if every boot in the house had a hollow heel. No, true, I wasn't thinking hollow heels particularly. Then he took up a stout walking stick, which was standing in the corner of the cupboard, felt its weight, and walked across the room with it to try it. Nothing hollow about this, at any rate, he said, after examining the ferrule closely. When we returned to the hall, he was interested in the sticks in the stand. He was fond of stout ones, Wigan, laughed Quarles. Well, I don't think there is much to interest us here. Our inspection of the house had been of the most casual kind. We hadn't even looked into some of the rooms, and the odd corners and fireplaces, to which I had given considerable attention on my former visit, hardly received a passing glance from Quarles. Have you looked at everything you want to see? I asked in astonishment. I think so. You said the cellars had been dug up, so they are of no interest, and I warrant the Bryants have already searched in every likely and unlikely place. What is the use of going over the same ground or in examining cabinets and drawers for false backs and false bottoms when others have done it for us? What is your next move, then? I think we may as well go back to Chelsea and talk about it. I must admit that in spite of my knowledge of Quarles, I thought he was beaten this time, and that he was using bluff to hide his disappointment. I thought he had gone to Norberton with a fixed idea in his mind, only to discover that he had made a mistake. We would not discuss the affair on our way back to Chelsea. But when we reached the house, 
He called for Zena, and the three of us retired to the empty room. "'Well, dear, is the ten percent reward to make us rich beyond the dreams of avarice?' asked Zena. "'It is impossible to say.' "'Then you haven't found the money?' "'We haven't counted it yet,' was the answer. "'Let us consider the points. The first is this. Nine years before his death, Mr. Ottershaw made his will, frankly expressing a wish that he could take his money with him. Therefore, I think we may assume that he was not in love with his relatives and was not delighted that his death should profit them. The next sentence in the will seems to express a doubt as to whether the treasure could be taken or not, and it suggests that something occurred about the time to make it appear feasible. So we get a will, and if it is to be read literally, as I believe it is meant to be, there can apparently be only one possible hiding place, somewhere in the ground underneath the house. This is so obvious that one would hardly expect it to be the solution, and so there is particular significance in his statement that he didn't send it out of the house. He hid it, he says, when he was alone in one of the rooms. Let us suppose it was his bedroom. From there he certainly could not bury his treasure in the ground. We have decided that the hiding place could not be in any part of the brickwork or in the woodwork. Therefore, we are driven to the conclusion that it was placed in some piece of furniture or some receptacle made for the purpose. Since I believe he thought it possible to take his wealth with him, the latter supposition seems to me the more probable. Bank notes a large sum would only occupy a small space, I said. I don't think the treasure was in money, said Quarles. The fact that a diamond was given to Sims and not money suggests that the treasure was in precious stones. If he spent everything he could in this way, giving hard cash for a gem, and thus doing away with the necessity for inquiry and references, the lack of evidence regarding his wealth is partly explained. Great wealth can be sunk in a very small parcel of the gems, and if he hoped to take his wealth with him, it must be small in bulk. So that it could be placed in his coffin, you mean, said Zena. Sims declares nothing was placed in his coffin, said Quarles. He is most definite upon the point. And I have already pointed out that since he wished to be cremated, Mr. Ottershaw would hardly make any such arrangement, I said. He may have wished to be cremated, but he may not have expected to be, said Quarles. As a matter of fact, he left certain instructions which point to a doubt. Sims was to lay him out and say that he was decently cared for. So anxious was Mr. Ottershaw about this that he left a letter for Sims to show to the Bryants. This is a most significant fact. Then you suspect the man Sims? said Zena. We will go a step further before I answer that question. Today, Wigan, we have made a curious discovery. All Mr. Ottershaw's walking sticks were very stout ones, and that he really used them, not merely carried them, the condition of the ferrules proofs. Moreover, there was a curious fact about his boots. They were large, the right one being a little larger than the other, and the right boot in every pair was the least trodden down. Indeed, showed little wear, either inside or out. I wonder if Sims could explain this. Zena was leaning forward, her eyes fixed upon the professor, and I was thinking of a boot with a hollow heel. Let's go back to the will for a moment, said Quarles. Although Mr. Ottershaw desired to be cremated, he did not put it in the form of a condition, as he might reasonably have done. He even mentions the expense, and the fact gives his relatives quite a good excuse for not doing as he desires. It seems to me he didn't care much one way or the other, and that his object was to make the relatives suffer for their greed, and suffer all the more because he didn't actually leave the money away from them. It was Zena's absurd question, Wigan, and her anger that the Bryants had not carried out the old man's wish, which gave me the germ of a theory. I believe if they had him cremated, they would have found the treasure. He gave them a chance, which they lost, by burying him. Then you believe Sims carried out his master's wishes, I said? I do. And managed to have the treasure buried with him? I do not believe Sims knows anything about a treasure, said Quarles. And I think he speaks the truth when he says that nothing but the body was buried. But Sims knew more about his master than anyone else. He could tell us something about their doings in Switzerland and Germany, for instance. He was very fond of his master and was trusted by him. We want to know what happened just after Mr. Ottershaw's death, I said. To know what occurred abroad would not help us much. I think it will, Quiles returned. Supposing Mr. Ottershaw had an accident abroad which necessitated the amputation of his right leg, and supposing in Germany, perhaps, he got the very best artificial limb money could purchase. A wooden leg, I exclaimed. Yes, not of the old sort, but the very best the instrument makers could devise. Mr. Ottershaw became proud of that leg and told no one about it, only his man knew. His right boot showed less sign of wear, 
because he helped that leg with a stout stick. The wooden foot would not stain the inside of a boot with moisture as a real foot does. When the Bryants went to see him, he complained of gout, an excuse for not walking, and so giving them a chance of discovering the leg. Then came the idea of secreting the treasure, and I suggest that it consists of gems concealed in that wooden leg. He didn't want the leg removed after his death, so Sims laid him out. Probably the leg is fitted with a steel, fire-resistant receptacle, which would have been found among the debris had the body been cremated. Then the treasure is buried with him, said Zena. Will they open the grave? I'm not sure whether the old man succeeded in carrying his wealth with him after all, said Quarles. Sims was fond of and sentimental about his master, and as we talked to him, Wigan, it seemed to me that there was something he had no intention of telling us. He was particularly insistent that nothing but the body had been buried, and appeared almost morbidly anxious to tell nothing but the exact truth. Tomorrow we will go to Fulham and ask him whether he removed the wooden leg before the coffin was screwed down. Quarles's conjecture proved to be right. Sims had been sentimental about the leg because his master was so proud of it, and the night before the coffin was fastened down, had crept silently into the room and taken it off, placing a thick shawl rolled up under the shroud, so that the corpse would appear as it was before. It had not occurred to him at the time that his master was so anxious that the leg should be buried with him, but since that night he had wondered whether he had done wrong. The wooden leg was hidden in his bedroom. When he was told that it probably contained a treasure, his fear and amazement were almost painful to witness. He was evidently quite innocent of any idea of robbery. Ingeniously concealed in the top part of the leg, we found a steel cylinder full of gems. Mr. Ottershaw must have made a lot of money while he was in India, for Quarles's ten percent of the value obtained for the jewels came to over twelve thousand pounds. Half of it goes to Zena as a wedding present, he said on the day he banked money. I shouldn't wait long if I were you, Wigan. But, Grandfather, I... My dear, I am not always thinking of myself. You have your life before you, and I want you to be happy. My only condition is that there shall always be a place at your fireside for me. The tears were in Zena's eyes as she kissed him, but she looked at me, and I knew my waiting time was nearly over. Now I shall rest on my laurels, Wigan, and trouble no more about mysteries, said Quarles. He meant it, but I very much doubt whether a ruling passion is so easily controlled. We shall see. End of the search for the missing fortune.